I really enjoy messing around with older computers, and for that reason, often find myself perusing sites like Facebook Marketplace or eBay for interesting deals, which is exactly what I was doing when I came across this used Lenovo P310. Is this six-year-old workstation a great platform for something like a home server, or is it just an OEM scrap heap? Or maybe a little bit of both? Let's find out. Like I mentioned earlier, I came across this Lenovo P310 workstation while browsing eBay, and after taxes and shipping fees, I was able to pick it up for a ride at $200. I've done a lot recently with Intel 4th Gen processors, so I was a little curious if there were any good deals on something a little bit newer. This Lenovo uses 6th Gen Skylake Intel processors, and this one specifically comes with the Xeon E3 1275v5 a 4-core, 8-thread CPU with a base clock of 3.6GHz and a boost clock of 4GHz, which essentially positions this between the i7-6700 and 6700K in terms of clock speeds. I might have gotten a little too excited about this CPU because, well, back when I first really got into building PCs, I was only able to afford an older AMD FX6300, and the 6700K was sort of a dream CPU for me at the time. So it's very possible that this processor isn't quite as powerful as what I have in my head, but it still has four cores and eight threads and is on the 14 nanometer process node that Intel only moved away from not that long ago. Also, unlike many of its other Xeon counterparts, the 1275v5 includes integrated graphics, meaning we don't necessarily have to have a dedicated GPU. Speaking of GPUs, this system actually comes with one, the Nvidia Quadro K1200. If you just saw this GPU for the first time, you probably wouldn't think that it's that powerful. And you'd be correct. The K1200 uses a variant of the Maxwell GM107 die, and is fairly close in spec to something like a GTX 750 or 750Ti. However, this card does come with 4GB of GDDR5 memory, and supports up to 4 DisplayPort 1.2 outputs at 4K60. It also only has a 45W power draw, meaning it doesn't require external power. As far as I can tell, it does support at least one NVENC encoder stream, so it could potentially be a nice card to drop into a Plex or Jellyfin server for transcoding. With the 4GB of GDDR5, 4 mini DisplayPort outputs, and NVENC encoding, this could be a decent budget workstation card depending on the use case. And I imagine there are use cases, because I was a little shocked to see that this card regularly sells used on eBay for around $100. This machine came with two 8GB sticks of non-ECC DDR4 memory, clocked at 2133 megatransfers per second. With being a workstation, I would have loved to have gotten ECC memory, because this motherboard does in fact support unbuffered ECC DDR4, but standard desktop RAM should be fine. 2133 might seem a little slow compared to today's standards, but as far as I can tell, it's the maximum supported speed of the CPU and chipset. The power supply on this is definitely a step up from many other OEM PCs, providing up to 400 watts, and supposedly having an 80 plus platinum rating. It even has a 6 pin power connector for a GPU, which I wasn't expecting, meaning we could drop in something like a GTX 1650 Super, and potentially have a pretty sweet budget gaming PC. That is, if the power supply works as expected. While this is a step up from many other PSUs you might find in a Lenovo desktop, we still have the issue of proprietary or completely non-existent connectors. The motherboard uses a 10-pin power connector instead of the standard ATX 20 or 24-pin connector, and there aren't any SATA power connectors on the power supply. That's because the SATA power actually comes from these two headers here on the motherboard, which is common in Lenovo desktops for some reason. The motherboard is pretty decent aside from the odd power delivery, supporting a wide range of Intel 6th and 7th gen CPUs, and up to four sticks of unbuffered DDR4 memory, either ECC or non-ECC. The board has fairly good I.O. with six SATA 3 ports, a PCIe 3.0 by 16 slot, one PCI by 4 slot in a physical by 16 slot, and two open-ended by one PCIe slots, as well as decent rear I.O. Other than the power connectors, the motherboard is a standard ATX form factor, meaning it should be able to be repurposed in a different case. We got a few other things in this purchase, like this gigabit ethernet card, which is pretty handy, and a 500 gigabyte hard drive. 
Unfortunately, this hard drive was clearly on its last leg, as it took me nearly two minutes just to boot into Windows, and then kept every process at a crawl. So it immediately went to the recycling pile. The case isn't terrible necessarily, but for being a workstation PC, I wished it would be a little more spacious and have some better cable management, and also have more drive bays. I mean, for being a workstation with six SATA ports, why only have two drive bays? I guess there are five and a quarter inch bays, but this was built in 2016. Come on. At least things can be moved to a different case in the future. I tested to make sure this machine worked when I first got it, but before testing it anymore, I'd like to tear it down and get it cleaned up a bit. The teardown process was fairly straightforward, and not much stood out other than the thermal paste, which was the greasiest, liquidiest, it was odd, and just very messy. What is this stuff? It's so runny. I even got some down in the CPU socket, which is a first. I had to very carefully clean it out to avoid bending any pins. I used compressed air and a brush to clean all the components, but with how hot it's been, my phone crashed during the recording, so there's no footage of that. Putting everything back together was fairly simple, but cable management in this case was a massive pain. I don't know why they try to overcomplicate these cases so much, I mean it's a workstation, just keep it simple and easy and spacious. Also, I really hate these little rubber rivet things, so I just cut them off and use screws instead. I also put in a 128GB SSD so we could install Windows, and then finished up a little bit more cable management off camera. With everything all cleaned up and our SSD installed, let's go ahead and boot into Windows 10 Pro and see how this P310 performs. Now obviously, with a higher-end 6th gen Intel processor, you're not going to have any trouble with normal day-to-day -day computing, browsing the web, or consuming content, so I'll just go ahead and skip over all of that. Running Cinebench R15, we get a 3-run average of 779 in the multi-threaded test. Now this is only about a 9% increase over the 4th gen Xeon E3 1231v3 we looked at not too long ago but it managed to get that increase while consuming slightly less power, both while at idle and under full load. With this CPU, I'm worried we're starting to see a bit of a limitation with Cinebench R15, so I decided to go ahead and run Cinebench R23 as well, and here we see the newer 1275v5 pull ahead with around a 28% improvement in the multi-threaded score when compared to the older Xeon. Running PC Mark 10, we got scores of 72.79 in the Essentials category, 5245 in productivity, and 3589 in content creation. If we compare this to the 1231v3 system from earlier, it doesn't look that great, with the older system pulling ahead in productivity and content creation. However, this was the system I used with the budget streaming PC, so it included a GTX 1650. The 1650 is much newer than the Quadro K1200, which definitely helped in the productivity and content creation categories. To make sure the K1200 could be used as an encoder, I ran OBS using NVENC on the highest quality setting, and the K1200 handled it pretty well. So this card could be used to allow an older desktop to encode or transcode video, or it could be used in something like a Plex server. Testing the GPU reminded me that we actually have onboard graphics on the 1275v5, and I decided to go back and test our idle power draw with and without the Quadro card. With the card installed, the machine idled at around 28 watts, which isn't terrible, but when we remove the K1200, our idle power drops to around 18 watts, which is pretty good. Just for fun, I did drop in a GTX 1650 Super just to make sure it booted successfully with the 400 watt power supply, which it did. However, I'll save more on that topic for a later video. So far, I've been somewhat impressed with the system, but that doesn't mean it didn't come with any drawbacks. Obviously, I kind of got the short end of the stick with the essentially dead hard drive, but my luck got even worse on this purchase. When doing some testing, the machine just randomly shut down. After booting back up, it ran for a few minutes, and then did the exact same thing. It kept doing this, and the time between failures got shorter and shorter, which led me to guess that it might be a power supply issue. After buying a 24-10 to 10 pin adapter and swapping the power supply, 
I was indeed able to confirm that this 400 watt power supply did fail on me. I opened it up safely just to see if there was an obvious issue that I might consider tackling, but everything looked fairly normal to my eyes, so I doubt this is worth trying to fix, at least not with my electrical skills. Fortunately, I was able to get all of the efficiency tests done before this failed. Replacing the power supply is a bit wonky, unfortunately, because while the 24 to 10 pin adapter works, it causes the power supply and anything else powered by it to keep running even when the PC shuts off. So you'll either have to manually turn off the PSU every time you shut your PC down or rig something else up. The other main pain in the butt was really just this case. It's awkwardly tight and has little room for adding drives. If I use this machine in any capacity moving forward, I'll probably look at replacing the case. So I spent 200 bucks on this thing. What are some of the potential ways I could use this Lenovo P310? Well, one of my favorite uses for older PCs is as a NAS. With six SATA ports, multiple PCIe lanes for expansion, and potential for up to 64 gigabytes of ECC memory, this could be a really great platform for something like TrueNAS Core or TrueNAS Scale. Another thought I had would be using this as a dedicated streaming machine. The 4-core 8-thread Skylake Xeon has plenty of horsepower to encode a live stream, and you could even have this function as both a dedicated streaming PC and a NAS to store a local copy of all your streams and any other footage. You might not be able to run a ton of VMs with only 4 cores and 8 threads, but this PC could work pretty well running a hypervisor like Proxmox or even something like Unraid if you wanted to mess around with running virtual machines, containers, or hosting things like web or game servers. And like I mentioned before, because the PSU does have a 6-pin power adapter, if you bought a similar PC to this and the power supply worked, it could be great for a simple budget gaming PC. I had a lot of fun checking out this Lenovo P310 workstation, and it was pretty cool to finally get my hands on a Skylake Xeon. It might not be the absolute best deal out there, but especially considering I might be able to make back close to half of my investment just by selling the Quadro K1200, I think this was a decent pickup for $200. But I'd love to hear what you think. Was this a good deal, or did I waste my money? What do you think is a better budget system to look for? I'd also love to hear how you think I should put this PC to use moving forward. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, as that really helps the channel out, and also get subscribed if you want to see more videos like these. If you're interested in some of the ideas I mentioned earlier, maybe check out this video here where I built a NAS using TrueNAS Scale, or this one where I convert another older Lenovo PC into a home server using Unraid. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you so much for watching, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.